Uh, so sometimes these sessions are going to be, maybe we'll go through several questions that are unrelated. But sometimes I'm going to get questions that are related to each other, and I'll put them all together. And that's what's going to happen this morning. I have two questions that we're going to talk about this morning, and they seem to me to be related, uh, and they're a big topic. So I'm just going to present one and then the other, and you'll see how they work together. So uh, the question, the first question we're going to talk about this morning is, what are angels? What do they do? Are they still active? There are questions here about angels. Uh, that I've been asked, and so I want to spend some time examining what the Bible teaches about angels. So Luke chapter 20 and verse 34, Luke 20 and verse 34, it says, Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So when Jesus is asked about the resurrection, he responds that in the resurrection we will be like angels. And specifically in two ways in verse 36, uh, we'll be like angels in verse 36. They cannot die anymore and they are equal to angels. Oh, the other part is in verse 35. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. So they don't marry and they cannot die. And the point I believe Jesus is getting at here is that in that realm we are going to be spiritual beings like angels. So angels are, to begin with, spiritual beings who serve God. Okay? And uh, because of the nature of this topic, I'm going to put a lot of the verses on the board. If you're wanting to take notes or something like that and look at these verses later, I'd recommend that. Uh, but here are some of the places that I would go to to prove the idea that angels are spiritual beings who serve God. This is uh, the statement of Gabriel who is talking to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, in Luke 1 and verse 19. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. So he is sent by God, he stands in the presence of God, and now he has a message from God about how Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to have a child. The other part about angels is that they are part of a spiritual hierarchy. And because of that... Um, there is sort of an order in the angelic realm. Uh, you see that in a couple of places. There are different types of angels uh, that are described in the Bible. Uh, so here I have Isaiah 6, verses 1 and 2. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. Okay, so you have the idea there of seraphim, which is a certain uh, type of angelic being. Uh, we don't really know more about them than what's here, uh, even though they're sort of talked about as if we're supposed to know what they are, uh, but they just are kind of described that way. Um, Jude 9 talks about the archangel Michael, and archangel is a sort of a head angel or one who has authority over other angels. It's also described in 1 Thessalonians 4, where it says the voice of an archangel will happen when, when Jesus returns. So uh, you see that there is evidence there that there is sort of a hierarchy, that maybe you've got head angels, maybe you've got different classes of angels. But I've got to be clear, that's not really spelled out. It's not like we can go and say, here's angel number one, angel number two. Other than Michael, who is named, uh, we don't really have a sense of what that's like. But the point of all of that is that there is an order, and all of that order is in service to God. <clears throat> Having said that, we need to say that man is also a part of that order because it is, man is described this way. This is Hebrews 2, verses 6 to 8, which is quoting Psalm 8, 4 to 6. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Okay, so man is lower than this class of spiritual beings that's being discussed in Psalm 8. We are lower. And that is not, you can see from the way that the text is written, that's not an insult. In fact, it's a, it's a sign of great glory. You know, you have made man just lower than the angels. Okay? You have given him dominion, and you've put everything into subjection under his feet. Meaning, man occupies a high station in terms of earth, and in this spiritual realm, man's just a little lower than someone like an angel. So, uh, the idea of the spiritual hierarchy then really is focused on the fact that angels are not on the same level as God or on, even on the same level as one another. And that's the reason why we have warnings sometimes in the New Testament about not worshiping angels. That happens several times. Colossians 2, 
It happens where John tries to do it in the Revelation, and he's told, don't worship me, I'm a fellow servant, worship God. The idea there is, no, 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 we're, we're down on the hierarchy. You worship God, God's the one who deserves worship. So, uh, I like to say that, that angels execute God's will on earth. That would be the way that I would describe what angels do. Now, the word angel means messenger. And so a lot of times what you have when you have angels, I understand I'm talking fast and I'm going through a lot of material. Uh, you'll see why when we get to the end of the class, because you'll see that I have more that I could not say uh, for time's sake. But um, angels are messengers. And so sometimes you get them delivering messages. Okay, so we talked about Zechariah a minute ago. Angels announced the birth of Samson, announced the birth of Zechariah, announced the birth of Jesus. Angels are there to give messages to the prophets. In fact, they give messages quite often in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, to the wise men, to Cornelius, to Philip. They're said to be the deliverers of the law of Moses in several places. But I put the idea of executing God's will on earth because I think we need to see it a little more broadly than just as a messenger. Uh, because the things that are described of angels doing in the Bible are more than just giving messages. So I want you to look with me in, in the book of Acts for a minute. Uh, Acts chapter 5. I'm just going to read a few passages uh, working through Acts here. And I think you'll see it's a little broader than just the idea of giving messages. Acts 5 and verse 19. Acts 5, 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in this temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Okay, so they opened the prison doors and let the apostles out. Turn over to Acts chapter 8. Acts 8 and verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So the angel tells Philip, go over here, and of course he's going to meet a chariot there. Uh, turn the page to Acts 10. Acts 10 and verse 3, it says, About the ninth hour of the day he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner, who is, whose house is by the sea. So an angel appears to Cornelius and says, hey, call for Peter. Okay, here's where he is. Uh, turn to chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Now, first of all, I want you to notice how much the angels are active in this part of the Bible. Okay, it's, it's impressive because you just keep seeing them come up over and over again. Acts chapter 12 and verse 7, Behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him and saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. Okay, so what's the message there? I don't see a message. Okay, I see an angel coming and, and basically setting Peter free and walking him through and then disappearing. Okay, uh, a little further in chapter 12, verse 23, it says, talking about Herod, who remember gives this speech and the people are saying the voice of a God, not a man. Verse 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give the God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Okay. No message there, just striking down, killing Herod. Now, it's judgment from God, certainly. But I would put that under the category of executing God's will on earth, which does include messages that God wants to communicate to people, but also includes whatever it is God wants done. If God wants people set free from prison, the angels are going to do that. If God wants people to be told, go call this person, do this, or give a message, he's going to do that. If God wants somebody to die, angels are also executors of that will, too. Uh, but God's will on earth executed by angels. So, you can put a lot of things in this category. Uh, angel finds Hagar. Angel guides Elijah uh, when he's running away from Jezebel. Angel shuts the mouths of the, the lions in the, the lion's den for Daniel. Uh, angels carry Lazarus from, from the grave to Abraham's bosom. 
sometimes the righteous entertain angels unawares, Hebrews chapter 13. So you have angels all over the place in the Bible, and their goal is to execute God's will on earth. So here's what I want you to get from this. Angels are the, one of the answers to the question, how does God do what God does? How does God do it? And we're going to talk about this more in a minute. But we don't really know the how, and angels are one of the hows. Okay? So if God wants something done, angels are, are his servants in order to do that. So the other part of the question is, are angels still active today? And I want to look at a couple of passages that are relevant here to try to understand just exactly what it is angels do today. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 1 first. Hebrews 1. Now, in, in Hebrews 1, uh, we're talking about how Jesus is greater than the angels, and that's important because it reinforces the hierarchy that we were talking about. Remember that? Okay? And Jesus is, is higher than the angels, and that's going to be talked about a lot in Hebrews 1. But at the end of Hebrews 1, in verse 14, it says, Are they, speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? ministering spirits sent to serve for the sake of those who are going to inherit salvation. So, part of executing God's will on earth is going to involve ministering to the people who are going to inherit salvation. That's you and me. Okay? The people who belong to God, God wants them in some way to be served, and so he sends his angels to serve them. Spiritual forces who are on our side. Friends in high places. That's the idea. All right? Turn over to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> Jesus has set a child in the midst. We're going to talk about this passage in the worship hour, so I'm not going to go into it too much. Uh, but Jesus has set a child in the midst of the disciples to teach them about humility. And he says in Matthew 18 and verse 10, Matthew 18, 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So that the idea of their angels stresses either some kind of ownership or some kind of connection or relationship. I believe the sense of this is that God has assigned angels to each person. Okay, so their angels then always see the face of my Father. I don't believe, and I'll talk about this more in the worship hour, I don't believe that the little children idea here means that only little children have angels, or only, angels are only watching out for little children, because I think Jesus uses the idea of little children much more broadly than that when he uses that in the New Testament. But the point is that, I mean, the point of the verse is, don't despise these people because God's going to know. Their angels always see the face of my Father. So they, God's going to know that's going to be reported to him quickly, and you're going to be in trouble. Okay, so that's the idea, but it's stressing the idea that there is a relationship here. Ministering spirits, serving those who will inherit salvation. Let me add this passage to it. We'll begin to process all of that. Psalm 91 and verse 11 says, for he, talking about blessings given to those who trust God, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent, you will trample underfoot. Okay, you may recognize that passage. That passage is the one that Satan uses to tempt Jesus to jump off the temple in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Okay, but the passage says something about angels guarding. So from that, when you combine that idea with the idea of Matthew 18, their angels, many people have gotten the idea of guardian angels, okay, that angels whose function is to protect us from physical injury. Okay, so let me say something about that. First of all, let me say, I don't believe that that's somehow impossible or that that doesn't happen. Okay, I can say from my own life that there are times when physical injury was imminent for me, and I don't know how I got out of that, but I thank God for it. So did that have something to do with angels? I don't know. Possible. But I would just say I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. However, I'm hesitant to say that what this passage 
and the one in Matthew 18 are saying is that angels are there keeping us from being harmed. The reason I'm hesitant to say that is the same reason that Jesus pushed back on the devil when he told him to jump off the temple because of the angels, which is, I don't believe that's a way we can, I, I believe it's a way we can become in danger of testing God. And so uh, we also have the open question of what happens when people do get physically hurt. Okay, what, what happened with the angels there? So that, that's a can of worms that I'm not really going to open today, but I'll just say that that's something that, that has been suggested about this. So what do angels do? Angels do God's will on earth. Are they still active? Yes. Yes, I believe angels are still active. I believe angels are still ministering to those who will inherit salvation. I don't know that they're going to appear in visions or to people in the same way they did in the Bible. But I do know that they are part of how God executes his will on earth. And so they're a part of that, the answer to that question. So there are probably many things. Have you ever wondered when you pray for something, how you get it? Like you pray for food, or you pray for help, or you pray for health. Well, how does God do that? You know, what, what, what's the, what are the ins and outs of God doing all of that? And sometimes I know different kinds of people. Some people say, no, I don't care, I just God does it. And then other people are like, tell me exactly how. You know, that's, that's the difference in between people. But I believe angels are one of the answers to the question, how? How does God do it? Well, he uses his servants. So, a couple of things. Uh, so I would just say that's still happening, and I am, I'm sure that angels are still a part of that. We might not see that. We might not be able to have that detailed in the same way it is in the Bible, but I believe that's what the scriptures teach. So, a couple of things, and then we'll be done with the angels here. I'm impressed by the fact that in the angelic hierarchy, the higher serve the lower. You know we're lower than angels, right? Yet angels serve us. Isn't that amazing? That even in the spiritual realm, in God's kingdom, the higher serves the lower. So, if the higher is willing to serve the lower at the request of God, then what about you and me? Well, we need to be willing to serve those lower than we are. That's the way the kingdom works. It is upside down in that way. And I'm impressed by that. Even the angels don't seem to complain and grumble about that. They just trust God. The second thing is that angels' obedience is an example to us. We know that because Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That implies that in heaven, God's will is done perfectly. And the prayer is that on earth, things would reflect God's authority the way they do in heaven. So angels' obedience is an example to us. Because angels obey in faith and in humility. They obey without fully understanding. We know that because they're curious about things that happen on earth. They don't know what all is going to happen, but they trust God and obey anyway. So we should live in the same way. That's question number one. You'll see that related to that is the second question I've been asked, which is, what are demons? And what do they do? And are they still active? Now that question came from our readings in the Gospels this year, this last year. Um, it's hard to miss the demons in the Gospels. They're all over the place. Jesus is casting out demons right and left. And the question was just, just what are we reading about? And whether or not those uh, activities persist today. Since those two questions, angels and demons, seem to go well together, I thought we'd just cover them both in the next 12 minutes. All right, so uh, demons are spiritual beings who serve Satan. So in many ways, they are the equivalent of angels in the demonic realm. In fact, sometimes they are called the devil's angels. Okay? They're servants of Satan. Uh, the importance of calling them spiritual beings is that they're not visible okay, to, to physical eyes. And that's important because that means we're not always going to be able to track their activity, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. The same is true with angels. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not real and they're not active. So, uh, demons execute Satan's will on earth. The will of Satan, as I put here, is destruction and lies and sin. So, one of the things that's remarkable about the accounts of demon possession is that they are always destructive to the person who is possessed. Uh, let's just read a couple of passages here. Let's look at Mark chapter 9. Actually, just one. Mark chapter 9.
Mark 9 and verse 17 says, Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Uh, a little further down, verse 21, Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. It is often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Now, you see that? The fate of those who are demon-possessed is awful. And he says, even from childhood, the demon has been trying to, trying to kill him. Uh, you also remember the, the man, the Gadarene demoniac, who lives out in the tombs because he can't be around people, and they try to bind him with chains, and he breaks the chains, he's cutting himself on the rocks, he's screaming all the time. Okay? It, it is destructive, and demon possession was a destructive thing because that's, that's part of Satan's will. Satan's will is to destroy, and of course to lie and to cause to sin. So it was bad news when you had a demon. The demons also recognize Jesus. And they try to point out of Paul being a gospel preacher in the, in the town of Philippi. But it's not because they're interested in the truth, right? Oh, here we are. It's Jesus. Oh, great. Jesus has come. You know, instead, it is a very antagonistic relationship, especially because they know Jesus is going to punish them. But their goal is the opposite of Jesus' goal. Their goal is to spread the agenda of Satan, to work Satan's will. What's interesting about the Gospels is that they read very differently from the Old Testament. You read the Old Testament, you hardly have anything in the Old Testament that even refers to demons. Okay, there are a couple of references to goat demons or goat idols, uh, depending on what translation you're using. But nothing at all like the possession idea that we see in the New Testament. And then you turn the page to Matthew, and bam, they are everywhere. There's demons everywhere. And the people know they're demons. Like the people who are possessed, and the people who are watching the people who are possessed. Everybody knows this is a demon at work. And I think that's important. I think it's important because many people have suggested that demon possession is nothing more than mental illness. And that was the way they would have described mental illness. So they would read that account we just read and say, well, maybe that's some form of epilepsy. You know, maybe there's something there with uh, some kind of personality disorders. You know, we've got all these explanations in modern clinical terms. And maybe they were just ancient peoples. And, and so they just said, well, he must be possessed by a demon. Well, I have a problem with that. I have a couple, actually. Um, the first is that the New Testament clearly distinguishes between sickness and, and demon possession. So, here's a passage. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. Matthew 8 and verse 16. So, sick people, demon-possessed people are different. And sometimes there are demons, like the one that we talked about, who make people mute or who cause other physical problems, but the problem is not a sickness, the problem is a demon. And until the demon is cast out, the person's not going to get better. I want you to look with me in Luke chapter 4 for a moment. Luke 4. Luke 4, verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, come, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. So Jesus speaks to the demon as a demon. And the demon speaks about Jesus' authority and identity. So, if all that we're describing here is mental illness, then we have a problem if we're Bible believers, because Jesus both believes there's a demon, speaks to the demon, and casts out the demon. So, a real demonic being is being dealt with if we're to believe the Bible. So, I don't believe that we can come to the conclusion that this is just mental illness, if Jesus doesn't treat it as just an illness, but he treats it as some kind of uh, demonic, devilish possession. But I can just say this. If God can do what the Bible says he can do, can't we trust him about this too? Why, why do we find things like this hard to believe? That maybe there would be an activity of Satan 
and that only God could restrict it. If the Bible is true in its other things, I don't find this particularly hard to believe. I don't know why there would be a limit on the truth of what God says. Jesus not only has the power to control demons himself, but remember he gives it to his disciples. In fact, they are excited because even the demons are subject to us, they say in Luke chapter 10. But the big question that people want to know is, are, are demons still active today? Especially the idea of demon possession. Now, first of all, it seems important to me to say that demons are only active in the Bible when there is also an active power to restrict them. Can I say that again? Only active when there is an active power to restrict them, to cast them out. So, you don't see a time in the Bible when people are possessed by demons without somebody being able to exercise the demon. So, when you see demons, you see Jesus. When you see demons, you see apostles. But you don't see in the ancient times, in the times of the Old Testament, this widespread possession without anybody there to help. That's what I just said. Okay. Uh, it's also important to me that this power is always divinely bestowed. Okay, the idea that someone can cast out demons, it is not some kind of magic formula. You say these words and the demon has to go. He can't help it. In fact, I want to show you something in Acts chapter 19. This is important. Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> it is not something where demons have to obey certain laws of the universe and that we could just read in a book somewhere, this is how you deal with demons. Instead, you have to have the right authority uh, for casting out demons to work. Acts 19 and verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Kind of a funny story. They try to cast out demons by saying the right name. Jesus. And the demon laughs at him. He says, I, yeah, I know who Jesus is, and I know who Paul is, but who are you? In other words, you can't fake authority when you talk about casting out demons. Demons are going to respond to the authority of the one who has authority over them. And that's only something that is divinely bestowed. And I mean by that something that Jesus gave particularly to certain people in his day. All right, so let me answer the question. Are demons still active today? I do believe demons are still active today. I believe they're still attempting to execute Satan's will on earth. I am not sure that demons still possess people today, at least not against their will, uh, in the way that it appears to have happened during the New Testament time. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says that has changed. I cannot find anything. There are some passages that, in a prophetic way, seem to talk about the restriction of Satan, but I, I'm not sure that it could be clearly... Um, identified or connected to demons. But it seems to me that this is no longer the primary way Satan attacks people. I wonder if that's because God is not currently, currently bestowing this power to cast out demons uh, through these clear, inspired means that we talked about a minute ago. I would just say that this, I see this very similarly to the way I see angels. That is, we may not see angels, but that doesn't mean they're not at work. And we may not see demons, but that doesn't mean they are not at work. But the fact that we can't see angels doesn't mean that it's somehow excluded that they could ever talk to someone or appear to someone in the same way that we may not see demons, and that doesn't mean that they couldn't do some of the things that they did. But that is certainly not the typical way in which they work today. And to me, that's really much more important. What is the typical way that you and I are going to interact with God and Satan in our time. The ordinary ways in which they work. And for that, I think we have clear Bible precedent. How does Satan ordinarily work? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is, there are things that are out to attack us. They scheme against us. Satan and all his minions are trying to hurt us and to pull us away from God. And we must put on the armor of God. To me, that is much more pressing than something about demons. 
Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, to destroy arguments, and every lofty opinion. I am here to say that Satan is still working and that he has power, but that we can resist him because God has limited his power. He has delineated where Satan can and cannot go. We might not understand fully how God is doing everything today and how Satan is doing everything today, but it's a reminder that there is a battle going around us at all times and that we have an obligation to resist and to be aware. There are forces in this world that are not good. And if we are not actively resisting, then we can choose to follow the forces of evil. And that, to me, is the greatest concern. Thank you for your questions. More next month. Give me more if you have them. Thank you. We'll be dismissed for our classes.